This is Unsilo, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Uh, welcome to Unsiloed. Uh, this is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with uh, David Sachs, who is the author of a, a number of books. I think your first book was called Save the Deli. <laughs> okay, and I have to I have to find out whether or not you have, in fact, uh, single-handedly saved the deli <laughs> since the publication of that book. Uh, also, a book called Tastemakers, which is uh, kind of about, I guess, you know, craft, particularly food kind of craft space. Um, and then uh, Revenge of the Analog, Soul of an Entrepreneur, and, and this book here, The Future is Analog, which is uh, kind of, I guess, a sequel to Revenge of the Analog, but Revenge of the Analog was published in 2016, and some little thing intervened uh, called the COVID pandemic, which um, I, I think made the publication of this book a little bit more uh, urgent, okay? And uh, you, you're kind of describing the, during those years of the pandemic, uh, you know, how, how important it was, how you, you really wanted to double down on uh, the points made in revenge of the analog. Welcome, David. Thank you for having me, Greg. So, you know, I think that the, the, look, the, the title of the book is provocative, but I think it's a little bit misleading because I think that, you know, the message in, in the book is that kind of digital and analog are not substitutes but in a way, they're compliments, right? I mean, you, you know, you're not telling it the world that they need to move back into the caves or, you know, become the Amish. I think you said at some point, you're like, you know, like, you know, the goal is not to become like the Amish people and, and get rid of electricity and so forth. But but the the goal is to kind of figure out how to... I mean, if I could build a barn of that quality and turn the butter, you know. There's certain, there's certain things does, that are good It does get it. to your Berkeley lifestyle choice of like... <laughs> That's right. You know, move baling. to Brooklyn and make make pickles. Artisanal but, um, hay baling. Yeah, exactly. But but I think your your point is that you know here this is a tool. It's a very powerful powerful set of tools. Uh, but you know we have to make sure that they they work for us and that that we don't really you know work work for them. Um, so I mean, is it is it is it really about kind of compliments versus substitutes? Um, is that yeah, really the, I, I think it, the it language it, of it, comics. The, the language um, uh, of the title, it, it's provocative. It, it gets attention. It sells books. It's sizzle. But it is very much, um, uh, you know, a, a countervailing argument against the sort of de facto narrative that the future is digital. And I think that's, mm -hmm. that's what this book came out of. This book came out of having written the, the previous book, Revenge of Analog, which is really about sort of objects and ideas that were resurgent, mm -hmm. non-digital sort of things like bookstores and um, paper notebooks and, you know, vinyl records and film and so forth that, that had been growing. And I chronicled it. I would always get these, you know, in, in interviews or conferences I was speaking at or people writing to me, well, we know the future is digital. Well, the future has to be digital. You know, the, the future is definitely digital. Like mm -hmm. it was just this, this assumption that it's this truth. Um, it's our destiny and anything that questions that is obviously wrong or just foolish because the future is digital. Look, look what happened to us in the past, you know, 50 years. It's inevitable that everything's going to be digital. And then, um, and, and that assumption has really been at the core of like government policy, business, education, academia, you name it, right? So many different future focused decisions are based upon that very simplistic assumption that digital technology in whatever form it is, is going to be the inevitable superior version of whatever it is we're doing, whether that's mm -hmm. learning, working, eating, shopping, praying, whatnot. Right. And, uh, and, and this was something that I, you know, I would, I would talk about and I would debate and, and so forth. And then, you know, here we go, March, 2020, and suddenly the future is digital. It's all we have, right? We're, we're sitting at home in our sweatpants, working from home, learning from home, educating, trying to edu get our children educated from home, being entertained from home, socializing with friends from home, you know, attending Passover um, uh, dinner or, or, or church service or a funeral from home, um, doing all the things, you know, exercising, biking in our house, you know, to a screen, right? And it was like, well, this is it. The prophecy hath been fulfilled of this mm -hmm. digital future, at least for a period of a couple months for some people and longer for others. So what did we learn? What did we learn about that, right? Um, because that was sort of the inevitability of where we were heading. I mean, there are people like 
the great tech writer and thinker Kevin Kelly, not too far from you, who wrote a book called The Inevitable, which is like, these are the technologies that are inevitably going to be dominating us. And now this, you know, I wrote the book pre chat GPT. Now it's all about the same conversations about AI. It's inevitable that all jobs will be done by AI and everything, you know. And and I think that very binary thinking is is inherent in the conversations around digital technology because digital is a very binary thing. It's a one and a zero. It's an Apple or Samsung, right? Um, uh, and, and so the title, the idea of the book is really saying, let's, we had this wild experience of living through this thing where aside from some lucky people in New Zealand for a couple months, like everyone in the world was forced into some version of this digital future, right? Mm -hmm. They were shopping online. They were learning online. They were going to school. They were, you know, doing an exercise class. They were having drinks with friends, like zoom cocktails. You know, what did we learn from that? as we're sort of reflecting on the future and the use of technology in it. And so that the, that is what the future is analog is, is, is this, is this declaration that, you know, not to spoil things. It was like, the future is not entirely digital, um, but, well, we it, but it it's sucked. certainly not, it sucked. Yeah. But it's certainly not, <laughs> you know, entirely analog too. It's not like take your phones, throw them in the river and, or don't throw them in the river because you pollute the river, but like recycle them, you know, no one's calling for that, let alone myself. Well, I mean, I think there's a difference between kind of front end and back end. I mean, I teach a course called Digital Transformation, and, and the message of that class is that, you know, every company has to be, you know, a software company to, to some degree. Um, but, you know, the, the question Software in is, back, business in front. I like that. <laughs> well, I mean, look, I, you know, and I teach these classes on, on digital transformation, but then, you know, here, here I am, right? My house is, is stuffed with, with, with books, right? And... Um, you know, I'm always going to concerts and, and to the theater and and so forth, and and so people are like, well, how is that possible, right? You know, you're you're Mr. Mr. Digital, and and you know, here here you are with with all your you know paper. I think I'm the only person in the city of Berkeley who gets the paper copy of the Financial Times, and they they keep pressuring me, you know, like <laughs> they keep ratcheting up the rates and 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 trying to force me into. The, I mean, Berkeley the, yeah. is not exactly the FT demographic, but that's a whole other story. That's... Well, okay, that may be the only reason. Yeah, maybe nobody gets the digital copy either. But um, but but it, you know, it seems like that that the, these things are not in, necessarily in conflict. I, I did a um, uh, I was invited to give a talk to this conference on this like food tech conference, and oh, God. and and it seemed it seemed to me that you know, these two trends, one is towards tech and then one is towards, you know, more organic and, you know, farm, farmers markets and stuff. They're, in other words, the, the farmers can essentially make their small scale production more commercially viable if they can, you know, disseminate information more easily about, you know, where they're going to be. And, and uh, you know, people can, you know, search online and figure out like, oh, here's where the farmer's market is and, and, and that sort of stuff. So, I mean, is is it really about the, I mean, because you emphasize it's it's about the, the experience of your, your daily life and how, you know, the digitization of that is, is what is so, is, is so dis destructive to your subjective well-being. Yeah, I, I think it. I think it is really this question of a struggle, and I don't mean a a battle, um, but just a a a wrestling of balance in a way, and a, and a continual learning of what is that right balance for each individual, for each family, for each household, for each organization, for each society of digital technology and the sort of non-digital equivalent, right? Mm -hmm. And the pandemic gave us this incredible, hopefully once in a lifetime or once in history, chance of like, here's all of it. Here you go, all digital, right? There's your, you know, your endless start. You like, you love digital, here you go, this is it. You love watching Netflix at home in your sweatpants, that's all you can do for two months, three months, a year, whatever. Where all of us viscerally all of a sudden understood what parts of it worked for us and what parts of it don't. And so some people are like, this is great. I never want to go into an office again. And they mm -hmm. still remain at home. Right. Um, I don't think there's a lot of people out there who are like, my kid is so happy learning at home from an iPad. I am never sending them back to school that, that there's a minority of people for whom that still resonates, but you know, 99% of people around the world, regardless of the type of school they're in or the age of their kids or whatever is like, 
get get them back to a classroom. This is bad on every single level, right? And then there's the other areas where it's mixed, you know, shopping. Like you go to a grocery store as I did yesterday to get groceries for the fifth time this week. Um, and they're still full. They're packed mm. with people squeezing melons and picking up chicken and doing these things. And yet, you know, I see the the grocery delivery vans driving around my neighborhood as well, right? Um, the record stores, the bookstores, the clothing stores, like there's still lots of people in them on a given day or a given weekend. And yet the Amazon trucks still, you know, are clogging up my street uh, on a daily basis. Um, it, it's not this either or. And I think this balance is, is discovering where digital makes our lives better, where it increases our, you know, the efficiency, whether it's economic efficiency or whether it's time, um, uh, whether it gives us an experience that we can't necessarily have. Um, uh, like my son has discovered Nintendo. Um, my brother-in-law has a Nintendo Switch. My son's six years old. He's, you know, he's really into Super Mario Brothers. We broke up my old Super Nintendo. He's really into like that. He was like amazed by that. Loves it. But he's also really gotten into chess and loves playing mm -hmm. chess. Right. And also loves playing in the playground and loves playing Frisbee and loves playing catch and, and doing all the things that kids like. And it's not one versus the other. It's not this either or. And I think that's such a simplistic notion that the tech industry, Silicon Valley is sort of sees as its mission to replace the things about the world that we, we might value. You know, th this is, mm -hmm. you know, th the great nothing burger of, of tech innovation of the past three years is, is the metaverse, the, the Facebook metaverse, yeah, right. right? The yeah. know, billions of dollars that could have gone into climate technology or God knows what squandered on like headsets and stupid little avatars that nobody used. And the amount of sort of companies and things that are like, what's our metaverse strategy? We're all in on the metaverse. You know, we're going to be a metaverse first brand, blah, 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 blah. This is the future. And nobody used it. Now it's all just like quietly dying. Um, uh, and, and that's because it was this narrow, like literally narrow version of like the, it's like, this is the best future we have is walking around with sitting there with screens on our strapped to our eyes. Um, that doesn't reflect the reality of human existence, which we learned about in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But but look, there's I think there's a positive claim and, and a normative claim, right? And the normative claim is that like, you know, that the the analog world has a, a lot of things that simply cannot be replaced with with digital, and therefore, you know, you will be perhaps more productive perhaps happier, you know, perhaps more fulfilled and, and more engaged if you stick with the analog world in these different domains. But then there's the, the positive claim, which is that, you know, people are not going to, you know, buy into this, this, this vision and are not going to do this stuff. Now, you could have the one be true without the other one being true, right? You could say, you know, digital synagogue sucks. And yet, people might wind up doing it simply because it's 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 easier or because you know the 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 companies that are kind of selling them this are are really good at uh you know getting them addicted or, or manipulating them addicted in this way. to digital synagogue well, <laughs> a cautionary a cautionary after yeshiva right. school special <laughs> probably not the best example but but I mean, do you are you're making both claims though? You're saying that because it's inferior, you don't like because the metaverse is a stupid idea. Like people aren't going to do it. But you could imagine a world where they do it, even though it 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 sucks. Right? If it becomes the standard, right? Um, mm -hmm. If it becomes the thing that everyone does because they have to do, it just becomes the sort of de facto thing, like cashless payment. Yeah. Right? Um, where there are times when cash is easier, there are times when cash is, is, is more cumbersome, and yet the cashless payment has issues of its own, um, but it becomes quickly the de facto standard as more and more places move to it for ease or convenience or because they're paying fees or they built in the infrastructure or whatever. I think the thing we're, we're getting at here is like, again, the, the, the world of digital tends to deal in these absolutes, which is why we're seeing the framing around the the thing on AI is like, will AI kill us? Will it destroy humanity? Will it take all our jobs? Will it cr save the world? And it's like, it's going to do all sorts of things. It'll probably do a lot of good things, a lot of bad things, a lot of what someone said today, like just mediocre crap. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. it's like, wow, all the LinkedIn posts are now made by AI and you can't tell the difference because it's all just kind of like the same 
you know, rephrasing of like Simon Sinek quotes. Um, uh, and, and I think, we, you know, we, we love absolute answers. We love, especially when it comes to the, anything around the future. What is it, what's going to happen tomorrow? You know, are we going to, are we going to be, you know, the dominant force or are we going to be, you know, is it going to be sunny or is it going to be rainy? And it's like, well, it could be cloudy with, with a mix of some showers. And, and I think we, it's, it's hard. It's hard for us to think about that. You're like, well, what do I wear? What do I bring? I'm supposed to have a picnic. How do I do that? Like, is it raining or is it sunny? I need to know. Um, and I think, and then I think that the promise of digital that people bought into is like, it's going to be sunny. Don't you worry. It's going to be sunny. We, it's always sunny in the metaverse. Um, we guarantee it's going to be this. We guarantee that you know exactly what you get when you get a Peloton class. You know, you know exactly like what your day is going to look like, your, where your bike can be, who you're sitting next to. You have that sort of thing. But what I think we realized during the, the experience of the pandemic was all the things that we missed about that, that how yeah. actually very narrow that field of vision is. As I look at a image of myself of like two inches by one and a half inch speaking on the screen and that's, you know, blow up the screen, but like, this is what you get. Yeah, but I guess the question is, right, so, you know, in economics, we talk about positive versus negative feedback. If, you know, as you do more and more digital, you start craving more and more of the non-digital. But if, right, if as people do more and more digital, the the, the viability <coughs> of the analog kind of kind of goes away, right? So as more and more people switch to the digital New York Times, the, the price that I have to pay to support this delivery guy gets higher and higher. And sooner or later, I'm just going to have to flip, right? And if you... You know, you want to go to the you want to go to the theater and there's nobody there. Then you know the tickets get too expensive and they go out of business, right? So you want to send your kids out to play in the field, and if all the other kids are on Roblox, then you know they they can't play by themselves. So, you know, how to what extent is are we kind of being coerced into uh, you know digital ways of interaction, even though you know we might all prefer not to. It's true that there is this idea, right? That all these companies or platforms want that sort of network effect um, and that to, to achieve some sort of economy of scale to sort of break through. And, and again, if things become this de facto standard, um, such as email, then like your yeah. fax machine withers, let alone your, you know, delivery um, telegram person. Um, uh, I think there are limits to it though, right? There are limits to where... It is, and we, we, we smashed up against those limits, and I think we've all come to understand them a lot more. So, yeah, if a bunch of the kids in the neighborhood are going to be playing video games, there won't be as many kids at the park, but I think most of the kids realize, like, there's a limit to how many video games they want to play. And if you go to any park anywhere in the world, it's going to be filled with kids. Um, I think even the back-to-work thing, you know, you're seeing – even companies like Shopify, the, the Canadian e-commerce company, that's their headquarters was like around the corner from here. Many of the parents in my school worked there and they were the first to be like, we are remote first, remote only. This is the future. This is the future. And then the company has had a real hard time retaining people, mm -hmm. um, maintaining its culture, maintaining motivation. Now they're like, we're doing like, you know, head count, like something that's like not back to the office, but like, eh, but you know, there's a space here it has walls and an elevator and lights and there's desks it's not an office we're not bringing you back to the office but you know that that notion of limitations is one that i think that comes up against again that idea of, of the network effect and i think in certain areas it's going to be that you know digital control of a certain technology just makes so much sense so the economies of scale are there so much or it's so much more efficient um, uh, that, it, that it becomes the de facto standard. But, um, I think we can, we, we lose sight of the fact that like the world is analog. The world is not digital, right? The, the planet that we're on currently on fire, depending where you are, um, is this physical tactile thing. That's the core of what analog is. Uh, and the computers, the ones and zeros play a big role in certain parts of it, but even in the economy, you know, the number of jobs that are only able to be done on a computer is still a relatively decent, but 
minority size, right? You still need people to drive the things. You still need people to lift the things. You still need people to go out and plant the fields and round up the cattle and cook the burgers. And Oh, yes, AI and robots. It's going to do all this, and it's going to be like Star Trek, and you're just going to just be floating around on these little tubes or whatever. Um, and so the, there are just hard limitations, right? The body needs to get out. Like there's the, those hard limitations that were having us crawling up the walls in April of 2020 of like, I can't, I can't sit through another Zoom. Like I can't do another thing. I need to get outside. Those limitations still exist. And so any potential of that, um, of that switch to digital is the sort of default mode of living or of, of, of a certain type of business or a certain type of activity is going to come up against those hard limits. You see it in school, you see it in teaching, you see it in, in various parts of, of the working world. Now, some people would say that, you know, given your age, you're, I think you're at the tail end of, of, of Gen X, right? I just did a couple of podcasts on generations. They, they said that, you know, Gen X is the, the last generation that still remembers Right, a, a, a world that was uh, pre predominant, you know, pre-internet. Um, so, I mean, do you think that still having that that memory of a pre-internet world gives you a, a perspective that, you know, maybe the people younger than yourself have to kind of kind of learn the the hard way? Or um... I, I think the generational generationalizing. Um, uh, is is this great lazy um misstep that we always make around technology millennials aren't going to want to go out because millennials like experiences and look at the number you know we did us we ad firm did a survey and you know 17 out of 20 millennials like spotify therefore the record industry is dead you know like you know who's driving the growth and interest in all things analog it's younger people people who've grown up with this technology, right? Whether you look at the sales of vinyl records, whether you look at like pinball resurgence, whether you look at mm -hmm. whatever it is, book sales, you know, all this sort of stuff. It's not people of my generation or your generation. It's those younger than us. And why is it? Why does my 10 year old daughter love taking photos on an Instax camera? It's like, cause she's grown up her whole life taking photos on this stupid thing. And there's nothing new about it. There's nothing special about it. There's nothing magic about it. Whereas like for a grandparent using an iPad is still like, right but for a kid it's like oh yeah this thing yeah okay fine I've, I've seen it but like wow the film comes out of the camera um uh and i think there's been so much oversubscribed to this notion of generational preference of this idea of default that the discounts the analog reality and needs of those people in that these individuals in that generation which is like People who are, you know, 15 years old still have bodies and those bodies still need to like move in space. They still enjoy sunshine. They still benefit more from learning in a social group with other people than learning on a flat screen. Um, uh, and, and I think that was, that was, that was a huge assumption, right? It's like, well, this is, you know, the teens and the kids with their Minecraft and their Fortnite are going to love this online education. And they were the first to be like, where are my friends? This sucks. This is terrible. I, I mentored students at my old university, uh, McGill in Montreal. And, you know, there were a number of them that were, you know, I did it for a couple of years during the pandemic. And they, it was like the, I felt most sorry for them um, because what is the university experience, whether you're Berkeley or McGill or wherever, right? The university experience is not like the thing that your professor says, sorry, Greg. Um, it's sitting next to your friend yeah. while the professor says that thing and talking about it after and then going out for a drink or playing Frisbee or going to a party later or living with other people or learning how to cook or, you know, all these grand human experiences that doesn't change because of when someone is born. That's as true now as it was years ago. And that doesn't mean that those people won't be like on their phone a lot, but it doesn't devalue the other thing. Well, I mean, I, I do think, however, that there have been some some trends that that are um, difficult to reverse. So, for instance, um, you know, I am back at teaching in the classroom. Thank God for the last couple of years. But the attendance rate is is much lower than it was before the pandemic, right? And and I think you know, well, it's not uncommon to have forty percent of the class missing from all of the classes in, in an MBA program. And this was just no one would ever 
think about this. And I have to get up and explain to the students that not only is it good for them, but it's sort of an obligation on their part for their classmates because, you know, you learn from your, your classmates. Especially um, in MBA. And, it's all group work, right? Right. And then, you know, my friends who go to church, they say that, you know, church attendance is down. You go to the symphony and there's just empty seats everywhere, whereas, you know, we are, are out – even our outdoor – Shakespeare Theater here had to cancel their season, even though it was only like three or four years ago where you couldn't even get tickets to, to go into this. So, I mean, did, did is, is this just, are people going to, we thought that everybody would clamor to, to, you know, rush back and thank God I can go back to the theater. But in m many places, we, we, we haven't seen that. I mean, I, I, it depends. It, I mean, you know, I, I think there's like this, I think there's a bias of where it is in the thing, right? Maybe the symphony in Berkeley or in Oakland or, you know, whatever East Bay symphony is, is quiet or San Francisco. I don't know what, what symphony you're talking about. What symphony is it? San Francisco symphony. San Francisco symphony is, and maybe that's a feature of like economics and the hollowing out of the city core or some of the it thing. Can be, can be, can be habit it can, too, right? It can people be habit, just, right? People, people would just subscribe and subscribe. then subscribe. Yeah. And that's, you know. that's the thing, you know, I'm going to the blue Jays game tonight. I don't even like baseball. I'm going with my book club. It's sold out and they're doing terrible, right? Yeah, like San Francisco Giants have seen a huge drop off in, in, in attendance. Um, uh, so, you know, who knows, right? Like I've, I've gone to a couple of rock concerts recently and like some of them had, you know, 60% and some of them were completely sold out and absolutely packed. And my daughter's going to an Ed Sheeran concert in a few weeks for her birthday gift. And like, I tried to get a ticket for my son and I, and they were $300 each for the cheapest seats. Right. So, you know, Taylor I think Swift. Yeah. You know, I think there is, I think there is this sort of, um, there's a bias we could see of like, I went to this place and no one was there. And it's like, well, maybe, you know, Mahler doesn't draw as much as Beethoven. <laughs> um, or, or, you know, maybe the policies of Berkeley mm -hmm. to allow, I don't, do they film your classes? Are you allowed to stream them at home? No, we, we intend, we intentionally stopped filming it because. Okay. It, and they just don't show up. Excuse. Yeah. They just, and know, they get they, marked they... as absent and like it affects their marks. Well, we've we've had to change our, our policy because yeah. we didn't used to have a, a policy of attendance. And, and I think that a like, lot of that is this behavioral thing, right? It's the yeah. going back to work where people are like, I know I prefer it, but oh, it sucks. So I'm just not going to go in. Yeah. And and they had, there was recently a big, um, uh, a, a strike of federal workers here in Canada. And it was about new contract and benefits and so forth. But there was a big part and the workers were like, we cannot be forced back to the office, you know. This is not, so, we're going to stand by our right to work from home. They were like one of the last yeah. sectors. And the government's like, nope, non-negotiable. Here's your salary. Here's your benefits. Great. Non-negotiable. We are not doing that. And why is that? It's like, if you're, if you're saying, oh, this is it. This is the way you're sort of doing it. You're, you know, you are normalizing a certain type of behavior, which when you look at it is maybe not the healthiest behavior. Like there are advantages. There are advantages that might address some sort of economic disparity of the students who live close to campus and the students who come in from other parts of the Bay or, or whatever. There, there are advantages for people with different bodily abilities and, and, and restrictions and access and health and all these sorts of concerns. But like, is the solution that everybody goes back online? No. Right. And so you do, there are times when you have to draw a hard line, you know, what you're seeing with social media now with the surgeon general in the United States, um, different States banning social media platforms, like there's some extremism to it, but it's like, yeah, this ain't this. We, we realize that actually you, you do have to be proactive in sometimes making that, you know, that, that digital future, the, the standard. And I, I was at the barber today. Um, and the, the can't, barbers can't, can't do that. Can't do that online. Can't do that. <laughs> we are online. Um, no, I can't get, can't get the hair. Can't stream a haircut. No, unfortunately. No. And having my wife cut mine during the pandemic for a few months was gee, not a, not a great result. Um, but you know, I was, I was there in the chair and I was like, I like, Oh my God, an ashtray. And I was like, yeah. remember when people smoked everywhere? I was telling my kids about this. I'm like, yeah. people used to smoke cigarettes on the plane, on the airplanes. Plane. Right, the like I remember in, we, in the study libraries, the library, yeah, in the teachers' lounge at schools. Like you walk by the teachers' lounge in an elementary school, it'd just be like <laughs> smoke pouring out. Right in restaurants, and, and that's a recent thing that we changed. And when people are like, "Whoa, no, you can't do that," and it was like, "No, this is 
there is there need to be limits and i think that's what we that's this i hope is the thing that we take away from the pandemic because we clearly fucked up the rest um <laughs> you know a next pandemic comes where i think we're going to be even even worse shape than before <laughs> but um but I, the thing i hope we take away from it is like there are limits there are limits and limits are necessary and plunging forward into the newest technology because it's possible and reorienting our lives around it because that's something that seems attractive or maybe there's an economic advantage or something that someone can sell is is not something that we should do lightly we need to sort of a b test it in a way and say hey is is our life, our family, our household, our company, our organization, our society better with this? Did it improve it or does it not? Where does it improve it? Where does it make it worse? How do we, how do we again, readjust that balance? Because technology is not going anywhere and, 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 you know, advances in AI and blah, 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 you know, is, is going to create all sorts of new software, hardware opportunities, processes, um, uh, but, uh, the other thing that's not going anywhere is the analog reality of like, we are biological creatures living on this earth. And despite people's, you know, fantasies of the singularity or, um, you know, transhumanism or, uh, any of these other sort of, um, you know, Palo Alto, um, libertarian techno religious cult kind of things, you know, we still have bodies we st and those bodies have needs. And those needs are as simple as be having to move those bodies beyond the confines of, of the walls of where we live. Um, and there can be as complicated as, you know, the, the unseen and hard to quantify advantages of learning in person with other people or the value of sort of social connections that we get even in a grocery store when we talk for three seconds to the person at the checkout, right? What, what are those things? And, and I think because they're harder to quantify and they ha might have a cost to them, it's, we kind of discounted them for a while, but I think we can look back at the experience of the pandemic. And it's like, Hey, you know what? We didn't love all being at home. We didn't love all ordering everything online. We needed to get out. We need to do those things. Why is that? And how do we look at that when the next technology comes around and promises to deliver us into some new, you know, age of efficiency and, and perfection? Well, I mean, it seems like there's two different themes in, in the book. I mean, one is uh, getting out, you know, the physical interaction with the, the world, right? The non-human world. And then the second is, kind of, you know, interacting with, with other humans. So even when we think about the office, I mean, for me, uh, going to the office or going to a, a library or, you know, going to a different physical location to work was has always been important to me. And so during the pandemic, you know, I would go to my office every, most days and I was the only one in the building. It was me and there was a security guy there, you know, that was it. And, but for me, it, 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 it helped me to physically segregate the different parts of my life, right? But then the second thing is, you know, going to work and, and, and you know, finding other people and, and kind of working with them and, and communicating with them and, and creating bonds and, and, you know, helping to, to grease the skids of, of productivity and, and so forth, right? Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, with, with respect to the latter, that, that then becomes sort of a collective action problem, right? Because if you go there and there's nobody there... <laughs> Right. Then, then, you know, if that's what you're going for, then there's no reason to go there. And so you, that's where you need the, the, the coordinating mechanism, right? You need yeah. the, and, and now if you're going to have some people working from home, some people working in the office and, you know, you, then you really, then it becomes even more important that you have an orchestrator who can, you know, align people so that they, they're, they're there together when they need to be. Right. Yeah. Which is the grand wild experiment of our time as it comes to sort of the, the future of work. Um, uh, I was down at a big corporate office today picking something up and um, a big like CPG company here in Toronto. And it was like, I was there at noon and there was like 20 people from the company coming back with like piles of pizzas and bags of food. It was like everybody have lunch day Wednesdays, you know, everyone in the office on Wednesdays because that's the day we all like collaborate. So like bring your best ideas. But what if you have a really good idea on a Friday and no one's there, right? Mm -hmm. I have friends who went back to offices 
only to go sit in a room and do a zoom call with someone on a different floor. Cause the third person was also on a zoom call and like, couldn't figure out how to like do it together. And so, you know, it's it, that balance it's in an ideal world, right? Mm -hmm. Like you could be there and I could be next to you in the conference room and Greg, you can be up on the screen and, you know, Susie's on the conference call with us and, you know, Jag meets, you know, coming yeah. in on his metaverse set and like it all happens on the Thursday because that's when it works. But like reality again is takes place in the analog world where it's like, well, Jag meets sick, you know, his kid get, got, got, got the flu. He can't come in today. That meeting room's booked. The software is not working out. Um, uh, and so the, you know, it's, 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 it's very hard. And I think everybody is trying to have kind of the best of all worlds. You know, I think the, and, and it's, it's, there's a reason why it didn't happen like this previously, like this remote work in the way that people have been doing it, remote knowledge work, you know, through virtual platforms. Like I had a friend who worked for Dell computers and he was working remotely for like 10 years, 15 years ago. Right. Um, it's, technologically been capable, but there's reasons why it hasn't always worked and people yeah. keep going back and forth to it. And so that, that notion of the right balance, that notion of like using the time together for the best possible thing, it's great in theory and reality just again, has its own agenda. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting how sometimes people will say that, you know, productivity goes up when people are, you know, working from home. I You're mean, an economist, you know, <laughs> you know, the productivity paradox. Yeah. I mean, there, there there's uh, there's a bit of a measurement issue there. Um, I was having a talk, giving a talk yesterday about, um, you know, workplace politics and, and toxicity. And the, and the question was, you know, in, if you have remote work, does this make it easier or harder for you to kind of survive on the merits or does this make it easier or harder for you to survive based on politics and and it made me think about you know because i was your book was fresh in my mind about how you know serendipity obviously goes away when you move to remote because you don't just schedule a random meeting with a random person right yeah. you know you you only schedule meetings with people you have business with so um so in that sense it you know it might make the, the politics more more difficult because you you can't you're not going to just hey I want to schedule a talk so I can schmooze with you right but but in in some sense it, I mean you can ask people but no one's going to say yeah. yes right hey right. let's do a catch up huh yeah right so so I mean it I'm not it's, it's unclear what the what the impact is on on organizational politics we know it's going to impair kind of organizational creativity and innovation and, and collaboration and, and so forth. Um, but, but, you know, the serendipity pops up in other places. You mentioned just going to the store and, and, and running into people. I mean, do you think that it, it, the lack of that interaction, I mean, it, clearly it leads to unhappiness. It leads to loneliness. I mean, it, do you think it also makes people um, less empathetic and less human. I mean, when you look at interactions on the internet and you talk about this, right, they, they just, they, you're, even your, your deli chat, right, your Facebook group just devolved into this it. horrible, you know, hate fest. I mean, why is that? Why, why do people, why do their worst selves come out when they're, when they're interacting in a digital way, right, as opposed to a face-to-face -face way? Um, good question. I mean, on social media, you know, it's incentivized to generate the greatest emotional reaction. Um, and the greatest emotional reaction tends to be anger. Um, and it rewards it through, you know, algorithm to do that. So that's, that's, you know, the research and that's fairly well established. Um, but I think the thing that we all think about is like, you're texting with a friend, and you're like, cool, or something or, you know, okay. Or why didn't they get back to you? And you're like, what's the, what is the deal with Greg? What the nerve of that guy? Um, I don't know. What is it? You know, no, no, no. and then you're like, oh yeah, yeah, no, sorry. I was, I was busy with the thing. You're like, oh, okay. Mm, yeah. I totally misconstrued it. Why? Because I online in digital information is a capital I it's anything that can be encoded in the language of ones and zeros and transferred across, you know, whatever network you're using, right? Uh, text, video, picture, some sound, some combination thereof, but that's it. 
there's no body language. There's no yeah. subtle signals. There's no way, the way you stand when I see in the morning and walk by you in the, you know, the Berkeley common or whatever. Um, there's no, Hey, there's no like moments of serendipity and all those things are actually the most important information we have in, in the world. It's how the world works, right? It's why we still fly diplomats around the world to like have these conversations. It's, it's the subtlety that comes as a result of tens of thousands of years of human evolution in, you know, mutual communication that even without shared languages, we still have some sort of understanding of. Um, and we discount that in many ways as the sort of inefficiency of our, our meaty bodies, but really it's like our greatest strength. And when you talk about empathy and you talk about, you know, understanding and communication, like so much of that is physical. So much of that is based upon being in the same space, having mm -hmm. shared experiences with people like students, like coworkers, like people in, you know, a medical setting, for example, that, um, you can get information across in a digital way, but you're missing out on, on so much. And I think what I hear about from people who work at companies and other organizations is that it's like, yeah, the, the job part, the work part, like you can get the thing done. I can do the assignment from your class that you're teaching, but I'm not getting this sort of deeper understanding. I'm not getting a sense of who I am and how I'm relating to people. And then there's all the other sort of unseen opportunities that you're missing out on. You know, I, I, I have a neighbor named Craig. He lives two block, a block away from me. He's also a journalist. Ran into him in the street when he was walking his dog, blah, blah, blah. How you doing? We should get lunch. We had lunch. We joked around. He's like, you know, he's like, I, I saw him the next day. That was great. He's like, you know, I have a friend and he's, he needs someone to help him write something. And like, now I'm in touch with this friend to help him maybe write something. And it could be a, a good business opportunity for me. All because I ran into Craig at the park, right? Um, but there was no scenario where I was like dropping him a line on LinkedIn or being like, hey, did you know? It, so much of our world is relational. And so when you talk about politics, we think about it in this nasty kind of, you know, succession type way. I haven't seen the show, but I've, I've read a lot of people talking about it um, uh, or whatever it is, right? Like the, the idea of like, oh, it's all, it's all just politics. It's nasty. You work at a, li a, a very liberal university. I imagine the politics at Berkeley are spectacular. Um, and yet what is politics? It's, it's relationships. It's, it's influence. It's all these things that like in this idealistic hypothetical future, we can just do away with and only the best technical solution and the most viable candidate will be sort of the one that's awarded. But even then we know politics will play a role. It's, it's how humans work. It's how we deal and socialize and assess in all sorts of situations. And, um, and the idea that we just flatten that and then the technology will just sort of be this great evener is, is a great, tremendous misnomer, I think. Yeah, I mean, whenever you send somebody an email, right? I mean, it almost always uh, leads to, it, it, you know, it's always misconstrued. If you say, hey, you know, I need this report, whatever, people are like, well, this is pretty, but if you talk to them on the phone, it's, yeah. it's usually much better. That but when you call, yeah. but when you, when you, but when you call somebody, right, they usually just go straight to voicemail yeah. because you have, it's almost like nowadays you have to schedule, right? You know, can I, can I give you a call? And then yeah. they're like, well, I don't have room in my calendar and, and, and stuff like that. So it, you have to kind of force people to make themselves available for this, this non-digital interaction. Yeah. And then when, when you do, I mean, you have a meeting with someone, you have a lunch with them. It's, it's almost comical how easy it is often to like yeah. get things through. Right. Yeah, and the hard not... part is getting, the hard part is getting the, the meeting now, right? <laughs> Once you have it, it's all good, but yeah. You know, cause everybody's dispersed, but a couple of things, um, you know, we, we introduced an online MBA just recently here at Berkeley and, um, and it's, you know, there's obviously advantages, right? Because people can take it from all around the world and so forth. But to me, it seems like for every hour that you take from the classroom and put into digital, you then have to counterbalance it with something that is even more intensely human than a class, right? So, I mean, a class is people are sitting in horseshoe and there's a professor and it's not super interactive. But if you you know, if you have like group activities and group tasks and, you know, uh, group projects and, and social events and, you know, dinners and, and parties and so forth, you know, that's even more social. So if you if you go with uh, like a I call it like a um, 
you know, a dumbbell strategy instead of a bullet strategy where you have, you know, kind of remote plus like intensely social, then it might average out to be what we get, which is this normal kind of in-person but not super intense, uh, you know, classroom experience. I mean, is, is, that, is that a way to, you know, make sure that if we do get the benefits of digital, we don't necessarily, you know, give up? the too much in order to get those benefits? Well, I think it, it is. It's the key is sort of identifying which parts of our lives, which parts of an experience, let's say an MBA is a really good one, which parts of it make the most sense to use digital technology for, right? So like, let's go back. Calculating, Excel, spreadsheets, like great. Mm. You know, make your spreadsheets, do your stuff. Like nobody's, nobody's bringing out an abacus in an MBA course. Um, are there certain modules or sharing work or doing things of collaborative parts of the work that like make more sense to do online? Cause you're building charts or you're, 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 you're collaborating on parts of a presentation that, that, that sort of you can do in that way. Sure. But what is the key to an MBA? Right. Is it learning a uh, cost benefit analysis? Is it learning, you know, financial accounting? Is it learning all these hard skills uh, the, the the facts and figures that you teach and and the processes you teach or management theory or whatever, that's a big part no. of it. But what's the most that's important the... part of I have a I have an MBA from Berkeley or I have an MBA from Harvard or the Stanford. It's the you network. Know. It's the network, right? It's the people you know. And if the people you know are just little boxes on a screen, good luck getting those people to help you get a job in five or ten years. Right. If the people, you know, are people you stayed up late at night with putting together a presentation and then went out and had a celebratory drink or dinner afterward, uh, the people who sat through the lectures with you, the people who you walked to school with and had conversations with and came up with an idea that turned into a business. Great. A again, it's, it's, it's allowing the space for the natural way that humans behave to happen, um, without getting in the way of it. While I think again, taking advantage of the things that technology can do mm -hmm. better, right? Or, or more efficiently or, or, or no, or, or that, that, you know, we can't do it. You know, it's, it's hard to create like a forecasting spreadsheet of price things on paper without a calculator or a computer, right? Um, uh, or whatever one does in an MBA. I'm not sure. Uh, it, it, it's hard to sort of do those things. It's hard to like. Uh, but, but, you know, you, you, you're establishing, I don't know, you're establishing yourself in that world. Right. And, um, and again, I think it's uh, the biggest mistake that we got with education. And I think it's the big mistake when people still talk about the future of learning as being digital. And like, I hear once in a while, and I'm just like, no, hold on. Let me tell you why it's like. It, it, and this is comes from Larry Cuban, a gentleman across the Bay at Stanford who studied sort of history of ed tech and, and teaches it and is a wonderful man. Um, and I've talked to him for a couple of books and, and he said, you know, education isn't information. Information is facts, figures, theories, I, you know, these sort of ideas, but education is about relationships and the, and, and the information wraps itself around that. And that's the world. Nothing happens in a silo, right? Um, uh, you know, and there was this idea that I think we can separate ourselves from everything out beyond and like we could do it all in here in the screen. Um, and it's true. You can, you could like, Greg, you could sit in this room in your house or wherever you are. I don't even know this black box. You're literally in a black box. That's <laughs> it's, 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 it's got curtain. It's real it's, curtain here. It's the, it's real curtain. Folks, yeah, real curtain. this podcast doesn't skim. Not digital, no digital curtain. Real, there. we got the velour here, the quality goods. Yeah. You could sit in that black box and you could never leave. You could exercise on your screen and, mm -hmm. and get entertained and talk to people from all over the world and talk to other professors and write your papers and do your research. You know, you're an economist. You don't need to be out in the field, right? Um, and like, I guarantee that you would live a lesser life and the impact that you would have in this world would be lesser because you're missing out on the information that's beyond that, those walls and the experience of the world, which is beyond those walls. It's, 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 it's taking, it's taking stock, I guess, like this is something that I have a, I have a good friend. Um, Gregory Kaplan is an economist. Do you know him, Greg, do you know his work? No. Mm -hmm. He's at, he's at UFC. 
but he's not like a Milton Friedman maniac. Um, Australian, good, good guy. You know, and we've talked about it a lot. He's like, you know, I go out and I do what he calls qualitative research, which is like, I'm interviewing people and I'm talking to them. I'm seeing scenes and I'm doing things and whatever. And he does the quantitative, like looks at, you know, government data and, and statistics and sort of extrapolates. And, and, and you need both. You know, when you have too much of sort of the anecdotal, you're like, well, I went to the symphony and I didn't see a bunch of people. So the symphonies are all dying. Um, and on the other hand, you have just the raw data, which is like, you know, um, you know, spending on music is, is X and, and, and spending on other experiences Y, therefore, dot, 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 dot. And, and the world is both, right? The world is everything. And I think we just, we, we, we were sort of losing sight of that. And I think we still continually have the risk of losing sight of it because we can get everything in one place, because the information is so much easier and requires so much less effort in this way. Um, uh, but the value of that, that greater experience, the analog experience, the sort of more human experience isn't diminished simply because you don't have to step outside the curtained room of your garage or wherever the heck you are. Yeah. I mean, you can take, I think you could take a portfolio approach, right? So in other words, the more stuff we do online, that means the more trips to Napa we need to make sure our students do together, right? To, to counterbalance that. I mean, I certainly must be pandemic, nice. Yeah, See, I mean, during, I mean, during, yeah, I ain't getting the trip to Napa. And, and for the virtual students, we're going to do a metaverse trip to Napa. We'll send each no, you a no, bottle no, of wine. Uh, it work. doesn't I mean, work. For me, like during the during the pandemic, I mean, the more I, I had to do all my online classes, so I had to counterbalance that by having, you know, more dinner parties. So I actually had more yeah. dinner parties during the pandemic than I did before and, and after. Of course, I had to find some brave souls, you know, and stay within the, you know, you can't have more than 12 people in your house, according to the city of Berkeley. But, um, but you know, that I needed that to, to counterbalance all of this, this, you know, digital, digital interaction to keep the kind of average uh, more or less constant. Yeah. And I think that's it. It's, it's, you know, for over indexing in one way that we're going to need that balance. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, in the coming five years, you're going to see all sorts of corporate and institutional over indexing on, you know, AI based, um, solutions and technology. And there are going to be some unforeseen consequences and negative results. And I'm not talking about like all jobs gone and terminators taking over. I'm just talking about like, oh, this experience is now lesser because it's sort of gone too far in this direction, right? Like, oh, you know, this professor is grading all their papers based on AI and therefore they're missing out on a lot. And, and, and so you need, to, you need to constantly strive for that balance because the balance is all we have, right? I, I, there, there's this notion, again, this sort of messianic prophetic notion that comes out of Silicon Valley. And I don't mean the place, you know, 30 miles, um, Southwest you, I mean, the, the, not just the business, but the sort of ideology around it, which is like, when we reach this exalted state of X, um, then humanity will live in some sort of, you know, idealized harmony. And it's an ism like uh, communism or, um, or any other sort of messianic, you know, ism where it's like there is a destiny there is a a goal and we just need to get to that and once we do that then we're good then we're happy but what we have around us in everyday life the world we live in the earth that we must exist on and coexist on um, with all the other species and, and the climate and so forth the relationships we have the friends the families the colleagues the co-workers the neighbors um uh, our bodies, like this is the destiny. This is the thing, what we have right now. And so what, what brings that to its best state? And it's going to be different for everyone, right? It's, you know, some people are going to be happy sitting in their houses, looking at a screen, spinning their legs to a spin instructor in, in New York. And other people are going to be happy. You're getting out on their bike and going to the hills of Marin County and going mountain biking. Uh, and some people are going to do one on the day when it rains and the other one on the days when it's sunny. And that's, that's okay. It's like, it's, 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 it's allowing and sort of accepting that the plurality of the human experience is kind of the, the secret sauce of it. Now, I think the chapters that I, I found most uh, enjoyable in your book were about the kind of, you know, food and, um, and shopping, right? Because this is the, the this is, um, 
these these are being transformed by you know these apps and and large companies but th there's two stories there i mean one is about scale and one is about kind of bricks and mortars versus versus digital and and it seems like they're they're not necessarily you know they're, those stories are evolving separately and, and and i'm thinking in terms of you know look at warby parker right so warby parker started putting all of these bricks and mortar um eyeglass stores, you know, out of business. And then they realized, well, we're, we're, we can get into bricks and mortar. And when they got into bricks and mortar, they're, they're actually doing extremely well in, in, in bricks, bricks and mortar. Not so only that, but they have like spurned a ecosystem of Warby Parker clones. So in the neighborhood where my kid's school is here in downtown Toronto, um, there was a Warby Parker that opened and in a two year span, it became what I called the optical district. Whereas like there's a Warby Parker, there's an Oliver Quinn, Ollie Quinn. There's like a Harlow Hudson, like two names of any four year olds in a preschool around here, like Harley Hudson, Oliver Quinn, you know, oh, Nelson yeah. Bailey, like, like take two kids, like names, <laughs> like the names of millennials children. Combine them together with like nice design and like attractive pricing. And you're like, oh, okay, great. The, sorry, that, that's, my, that's my rant for that. But it's, it, it's the same thing. It's like this, this notion of Warby Parker is going to put all these glasses stores out of business. Warby Parker is brilliant for going and opening stores. And now like, okay, now it's just like more glasses. Like somehow people are wearing even more glasses than before. But what, what makes Warby Parker successful in, in the bricks and mortar world is that, you know, they've, they've, they've got this technology, which they developed, right, for, for the online. And, and so, you know, it, it doesn't mean necessarily that we're going to eliminate bricks and mortar, but we are going to have, I mean, the most successful bricks and mortar ones are the ones that know how to leverage this tech. I mean, I think about open table and how open, I used to work in restaurants when I was younger and you know, like keeping track of reservations and you know all this stuff. I mean, this was this was a, this was a nightmare. And you know, whether you're a small dentist or a small business person of any kind, right? Um, you just had enormous frictions in, in de dealing with you know your suppliers and your customers and so forth. And and it seems like the availability of these tech tools is is actually making it easier to to kind of run a small business, in particular, kind of a small bricks and mortar business. Yeah, I mean that's that is the promise, right? The promise of of technology and the hope of it, and the, and the and the thing that we like is this notion of like this is a supportive tool that will allow you to create something or connect with something or do some sort of thing in a in a better way, right? That's that productivity gain. You can you can do your own podcast now, and you just have to click on this link on Riverside versus like Greg, you better set up a radio station, um, which. <laughs> How big of an antenna could your backyard hold? Right. That's the advantage, right? The the advantage of like my barber today, I booked a haircut with her. I did it through Squire, the the online haircut booking booking platform, and that's that is you know the great advantage of it, right? And I think you see that in in the sort of world of commerce with things like Open Table, for example, or um, <clears throat> or or other sort of technologies that allow for like online ordering or whatever, where it gets troublesome, and I think. This is something that that is more about the business model than the technology. It's more about the sort of VC funded default um, way that the technology business has operated for the past two decades um, <clears throat> is is the idea of like, no, 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 no. It's not enough to just provide a service to someone. You must own the category. You must be yeah. the one player, which works if you're building an operating system where you need a default standard in order for everything to speak the same language or, um, or a hardware standard of, you know, USB, although they keep fucking that up every couple of years. Um, it's like, guys, universal, the U is in there, please don't change it. Oh God, I gotta buy new stuff. Um, but it's, it's that notion of that, that, that dominance, right? That there has yeah. to be just one. And so what, what did you see in the world of commerce? You see Amazon going to be like, we're going to be the place that sells all sorts of stuff to like, and by the way, if there's a product that's doing really well on our site, we're going to copy it, make it, sell it for three cents cheaper, put it up higher in our algorithm and put the other things out of business. Um, or Uber, 
Eats uh, and DoorDash and all the other sort of delivery things where it's like, oh, great, there's a taco restaurant that's doing really well in Berkeley and they serve birria tacos. Well, we're going to make a birria, birria taco out of the back of some food truck and have it to delivery and we're going to put it higher in the algorithm and we're going to steal the menu. We're actually going to poach the chef from the other one because we have access to all the data, right? We're going we're gonna to win and crush crush the other guys. And for the most part, it hasn't worked. All those ghost kitchen things have sort of fallen flat. There's a value in brands. People, mm -hmm. people value things other than the sort of hyper efficiency of everything. Um, uh, and, and I think that world of commerce is really interesting because, you know, you go back to the first sector that Amazon dominated books, right? And Amazon mm -hmm. is the biggest single bookseller anywhere, but they don't own 80 or 90 or hundred percent of the market or even 50% of the market. And that's because people like bookstores. Independent bookstores have been growing and expanding for a dozen years and they continue to. And uh, you saw that throughout the pandemic and the idea of like, oh, restaurants are done, independent restaurants are over. It's only going to be big chains or whatever. It's, it, it's not true because again, our tastes are different. Sometimes you want the most convenient, quickest thing. And sometimes mm -hmm. you want something that's going to be slower. You want that, you know, the resurgence of farmer's markets is this incredible story. Right. Um, I think it's like gone up. I can't remember what the percentage was, but like huge multiples over the past 30 years. Thank you very much. Berkeley, California. Um, bravo, Alice. You did well. Uh, and, and, you know, I went to the farmer's market here last night, spent God knows how much for like three cabbages and, you know, whatever other sad spring produce camps for here in Canada. Um, but it was wonderful. And I, and I had gone to a big supermarket the day before and I had ordered something online the day before. And it's, it's, you know, th there are different types of value. There are different types of experiences. We don't just want one monolithic thing. I think there's that, that, Again, that false assumption of like, well, we looked at the data and 60% of people prefer this. Therefore, 60 equals 100 because it's the majority, right? Yeah. And it's, it's simply not true. So, you know, you look at books. It's the same thing. My first book, Save the Deli, which you mentioned before, came out in 2009. That was, I think, a year or two after they had introduced the Kindle. And so I was like, well, I'm screwed just finished my first book. I'm like, I'm like a guy, I'm like a band and like the MP3 just came out and Napster just came out. Like I'm done. This is it. Better find another line of work and book sales, paper books have held up 10 to one. Like the numbers really haven't changed in over a decade. It's not like they're growing every year because people prefer to read in print, but some people love to read in eBooks and some people love to listen to audiobooks. And there's always going to be different segments of the market. Some people are going to buy their books online and some people are going to go to their local bookstore and some people are going to the library. And it's like publishing is a healthy business because that all exists, that balance. It, it, it comes back to balance again. And, and from moving away from these assumptions that there is going to be one winner, one dominant thing, it's, it's that diversity of the human experience that is the sort of core of the analog thing. Yeah, and I think a big part of the reason why book sales have gone up is because you know they, they they are cheaper to to buy and procure and easier to access in part because of Amazon, but but just to you know kind of wrap up on the, on this idea of complementarity, you know when I created this podcast for probably about twenty years, I wanted to um, do something like this, but but I my vision of it was to have um, book authors come to campus, and you know we would have a, a room and, and a audience and and would be up there on the on the stage and we'd have a nice conversation. And then afterwards there'd be some, some cocktails and, you know, some, some canapes and maybe all go out to dinner afterwards. And it was like, you know, that was the idea. And I still think that's a way, 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 way better idea. But, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's the reason why it never happened is because it, it's expensive. And because, I mean, at Berkeley, you can't even book a room, right. More than a couple of days ahead of time, right. To do something like this. And, and so, you know, the, when the pandemic hit, it was like, well, okay, you know, I, I can do this whole thing remotely. Now, I, I don't think that it's a, it's a, I don't think it's a good substitute. I think it's, it's clearly, you know, it's, it's, it's not the ideal, but it's, it's, if it's, you can't let the, the perfect get in the way of the, of the good to some degree. And I think that, you know, out of this, presumably if people listen to you, to this and they say, oh, wow, David, that, that guy's an interesting guy. Let's get him to come and speak to our 
you know, group of people. He can do it dog and pony for our folks in in the, in the flesh. And and I think that that's ultimately, you know, as we do more and more digital, it, it, it fuels a demand for more. I think it's know, that peak experience, right? Yeah, the peak experience. The peak experience is 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 the analog one, unless yeah. unless it's an inherently digital experience, unless it's like playing Nintendo. But even then, I went to the opening day of the Super Mario Brothers movie with my kids, and it was packed with kids and families and costumes and whatever. Yeah. And they were there to watch a digital product, a movie, an animated movie, but they were there in person, eating their popcorn, you know, mm-hmm. screaming, whatever. Like that was it. The, the peak experience is still the real one. And I think that's the same for school. And I think that's the same for culture and entertainment and conversations like this or conversations with a friend. I can catch up with my friend, Larry, who lives in Berkeley. We chat a couple times a year. We text back and forth or whatever, but like compared to being there and, and going out and, you know, having drinks and going to get coffee and eating with him and going for a walk and spending time, like nothing compares to that. And I think, I think that's it. We, we can we can use we have things between the everything and the nothing mm-hmm. right if your yeah. option is no mba or virtual mba you know maybe the virtual one is not a bad option um but if you have an option between virtual and real you know which experience is going to be the ultimate experience in terms yeah. of what you're going to get out of it cost availability timing geography, those things are going to get in the way. Those are realities, right? Um, uh, but is the conven- the most convenient, cheapest option always the best? I think that's the thing we have to wrap our head around. And, and you talked also about kind of entertainment and obviously, you know, doing improv is a little tough, but, you know, I've, I've become a big consumer of uh, the, the Met in HD and the uh, National Theater Live, right? And so, you know, these seem to be interesting hybrids because when you go to see National Theater Live in a movie theater, okay, you know, you are, you're not watching it at home on, on your screen. You're, you're, in a, you're in a theater with a whole bunch of other people. And, and then when you're watching it, they're performing in front of another group of people, right, in, in, in London. So it's, it's virtual, it's digital, but, you know, you have people in the room. And I always find it amazing when at the end of the play or at the end of the opera, all the people in the movie theater start clapping. <laughs> It's like, well, like who are you? They can't hear you. Right? Doesn't matter. But, You're clapping but for but each other. Ex- exactly, and and so it's it's not ideal. I mean, I'd much rather be at the at the Met, but that re- requires flying to you know New York and and uh, now has it increased? Has it and, has it changed your desire for like? Have you planned a trip? Have you thought about? Oh yeah, it it, it does. But what? But I think we're, the detrimental thing is that now you know I'll I'll consume less local theater because the the quality of the you know of the performances are just. It's so so much different, right? So I'll, I'll still go to local theater, but if I have to, it's a tougher choice between, you know, the Met and Renee Fleming on the big screen versus you know my my local singer, and uh, I'll still Your do local both, opera. But yeah, it's I'll still do both, but 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 the the um you know and probably my consumption of opera as a whole has has you know gone up, but uh, there's but there is this this substitution that happens to some degree, right? So it's great for the great for the folks who are p- performing in the Met. Maybe it's not so great for for people uh, you know at local. Um, I mean, it, it sounds like the San Francisco classical art scene could, could use <laughs> some reinvigoration, I guess. Um, and and, and um, yeah, I, you know, again, it's it's you're getting you're getting everything except all the other stuff that you're not getting from being there, right? Right. right. And um, and you know, you can have both. That's the beauty is like on Tuesday, yeah. you can go to the, see the Met in the movie theater. And on Wednesday, you can go to the, your local opera house or your, your, the symphony and, and get the full experience of seeing things in person. And on Thursday, you can go, you know, to a rock show, go see the dead play in Mount well, uh, or whoever's left. Yeah. Got the Greek theater right down the street. Well, look, oh, this is, this is fantastic. David, the book is called uh, future is, is analog, but, but don't forget the predecessor, Revenge is the Analog. We didn't even talk about Soul of an Entrepreneur. Perhaps we can discuss that another day. And, of course, Saving the Deli. So, you know, if you're in the Bay Area, let's go grab a... I um, mean, I'm, I'm, you sent me the invite for that talk. You had, okay. you had me at drinks and canapes. All right. Awesome. Thanks so much. Talk to you later. Thank you, Greg. 
This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.